Thank you everyone for being here and thank you Prashant for that excellent introduction to MRD. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about MRD specifically in acute lymphoblastic leukemia where we have learned an awful lot about MRD. As Prashant has already uh, demonstrated, MRD is that small amount of disease that's left, unfortunately, after we treat patients with cytoreductive therapy. And in adults with ALL, about 50% of patients may have measurable disease after their initial uh, treatments, depending on which technology we use. It's actually quite startling to think about the narrow dynamic range in which this field has made most of our clinical decisions about the success or failure of treatment for our patients, where we would previously define success as achieving less than 5% blasts and a complete remission with count recovery, but none of us can be happy these days with a patient who has 4% blasts or 0.4% blasts or even 0.04% blasts because we now have various technologies that Prashant has reviewed that allow us to quantify MRD at very low levels down to 10 to the minus six potentially with the next generation sequencing approach. And so this gives us a snapshot at different points in time of the patient's response to their therapy, uh, both their induction and their consolidation, potentially uh, immunologic effects that may have impact on their disease burden, and also the uh, deleterious factors such as high-risk genetics and niche effects that protect patients' uh, malignancy from the effects of chemotherapy. And so this gives us the most precise uh, measurement. Prashant already talked about this uh, meta-analysis that was performed a number of years ago now by Don Berry and Jerry Radich and others in both pediatric and adult ALL. And this study demonstrated that for both event-free survival and overall survival, the achievement of MRD negativity, however it was defined in the various studies, which was generally at a level of 0.1% or 0.01%, was associated with improvement of both event-free and overall overall survival in uh, children as well as in adults. Obviously, children do better, but it's interesting that the hazard ratio for overall survival between those who had no MRD and those who did was the same at 0.28. So this is a very strong prognostic factor for outcome in patients. What I'm showing here are all of the adult studies that were incorporated in this meta-analysis to show that even though there were different technologies and different thresholds of MRD assessment, there is no equivocation here. Every single study demonstrated that there was a fa more favorable outcome for patients who achieved MRD negativity after their initial um, few cycles of chemotherapy. And so um, this is uh, uh, very clear to us now. There are several studies that have been conducted via the Children's Oncology Group that the field has learned from. There have also been a number of studies uh, performed in adults with ALL. One of the most informative, I think, to look at is this one from the German GMAL group that looked at MRD after every cycle of therapy in a BFM backbone type of treatment. And I'm just showing their Kaplan-Meier curves for MRD positivity versus MRD negativity. At a few of the time points they looked at, including the end of the end of a consolidation, and after they um, had received some portion of their maintenance therapy. And you can see here that at every single time point throughout the course of a patient's therapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the achievement of MRD less than 10 to the minus 4 is always predictive of an improved outcome. And so the NCCN guidelines have incorporated these and other data to now formalize the importance of assessing MRD in adult patients who have ALL. This is considered an essential component of treatment uh, for any patient with ALL. And we'll talk a little bit about the downstream decision making that's done. I do want to talk a bit about why we should be very precise in our language about MRD uh, as this field unfolds, because as Prashant has already uh, introduced to us, there are differing levels of sensitivity for the different technologies, and what you call MRD negative may not be what I call MRD negative, may not be what Gail calls MRD negative. And so it's important to think about what are the things that impact what we're talking about. First of all, the quality of the bone marrow aspirate is very important. Um, there are a lot of demands on bone marrow aspirates these days, including a lot of clinical studies, a lot of research studies. Um, it's not suitable to take 30 ml of bone marrow aspirate and divvy out a couple of milliliters and send that for an MRD assessment because it will necessarily be hemodilute. So for an accurate MRD assessment, it's important to take the first pool, uh, generally just the first couple of milliliters, and segregate that out for the MRD assessment and not do a large 
large volume pool. It's also important if you're using a different provider, such as an interventional radiologist, to make sure they know the importance of that first pull for the MRD and not to assume that they know the importance of it because they're simply looking at what you've ordered in terms of total volume and they may take it all in one syringe and thus dilute the uh, assay for MRD. Also, MRD, importantly, is not binary. We use the terms MRD positive and MRD negative all the time, but this is a dynamic range. It's more precise for us to say MRD less than 10 to the minus 4, MRD less than 10 to the minus 5. And I think as the field unfolds and we start to apply these different technologies, it's important for us to, to talk about that more specifically. Um, as we'll talk about briefly, all fly, flow cytometry is not created equal. It's important to know uh, what antibody panels are being used. Uh, there's some operator dependence in the interpretation of the results. Uh, you need to collect enough cellular events to have a high sensitivity uh, assessment, and the interpretation is actually somewhat subjective. Um, we also need to think about that MRD may have different meanings in different contexts of different genotypes in ALL, different therapies with ALL, as well as different time points. So Prashant already talked a bit about flow cytometry-based MRD assessments, and I just wanted to add a few extra points to this introduction, specifically the need to capture a large number of events uh, in the flow cytometer in order to make an MRD assessment. You cannot have a single cell with a leukemia-associated immunophenotype and call that MRD. The Euroflow Consortium, as well as other consortia, have defined that there must be 20 to 50 events in the gate that you are calling the leukemia-associated immunophenotype in order to say that it is a true population, which translates to needing at least 200 to 500,000 cells to pass through the flow cytometer to even get to 10 to the minus 4 sensitivity, and millions of cells needing to be analyzed to get to the 10 to the minus 5 sensitivity. So although flow cytometry is a technology is available to every single person in this room, it's important for you to know what the actual threshold of sensitivity is if you're trying to get an MRD assessment, because many uh, clinical uh, hematopathology labs will not run enough events to give you these high sensitivity assessments, and they may not be using the appropriate antibody panels or have the expertise and in interpretation to actually give you an accurate MRD assessment. And if you can't get one, it is important to find a vendor who can provide one for you. So um, there have been some improvements in flow cytometry, specifically the so-called so next generation flow cytometry, which is trying to push the level of sensitivity down to 10 to the minus five. And this approach has been compared to standard uh, flow cytometry in ALL specifically, and shows that there are patients with disease burden considered negative by conventional flow cytometry that is detectable by next generation flow, which uses two tubes, meaning you actually have to collect even more bone marrow aspirate, so each one can be assessed appropriately. But this next generation flow is more predictive for outcome than conventional flow, showing that patients who have MRD less than 10 to the minus 5 with next generation flow have the best outcome. Those who are positive by both next gen and conventional flow have the worst, but those who are negative by conventional flow but positive by next generation flow actually have an outcome that's worse than those who are negative by both. So this sensitivity is important. Just to talk again about the number of events that need to be collected for next generation flow, this study nicely demonstrated in ALL patients that at the time of complete hematologic recovery here, um, I, I believe this is day 78, you truly need to collect four to five million cells in order to have an accurate assessment down to the 10 to the minus five level. Otherwise, the sensitivity for disease burden is lower. And so this is important to recognize because most flow cytometry labs are not running millions of events. A number of years ago, this was published in uh, 2015, the College of American Pathology did a survey asking various labs around the country what was the limit of detection for various diseases including lymphoblastic leukemia in blue, AML in red, CLL in green, and myeloma in purple, and asked what was their threshold of sensitivity that they could report. This uh, access, unfortunately, is not percentage. This was uh, published uh, as the number of laboratories, and I'll point out that only for ALL could about half of the labs surveyed 
report out a result down to 0.01% or 10 to the minus four. And for all of these disease, other diseases, the majority would only be able to report out to 0.1%. So this is important to remember. The alternative to flow cytometry, as has been introduced by Prashant, are the various genetic techniques. In the lymphoid malignancies, we have the opportunity to take advantage of the fact that lymphoid cells undergo a natural process of immunoreceptor gene rearrangement at the immunoglobulin genes as well as the T-cell receptors. Everyone will, rec will recall this as so-called VDJ recombination. And due to the clonal expansion of cells that have already undergone immunoreceptor rearrangement, we can actually use the these sequences as a naturally occurring genetic barcode to help us quantify specific uh, uh, leukemias. The most common approach um, that was uh, previously developed was quantitative PCR using patient-specific primers and probes that could then be used to quantify the number of templates present in a sample. Quantitative PCR is actually used quite extensively throughout Europe via the EuroMRD consortium, but because these reagents are developed on a per-patient basis, there was no way that this was ever going to be approved by the FDA in the United States because we do not have single patient assays in this country. In addition, this is very expensive technology because you have to employ a technician to actually do a Sanger sequencing read of the immunoglobulin receptor or the T-cell receptor and then test and validate various combinations of primers and probes. And so this is a laborious and expensive process. The alternative to this has now become next generation sequencing, which relies on so-called consensus PCR, meaning you use groups of primers that in aggregate will amplify the entire repertoire of a immunoglobulin or T cell uh, receptor. Uh, and with all of the amplimers that are amplified via this consensus PCR, you can then spatially allocate them on a silica plate in an Illumina sequencer, and by sequence by synthesis, you can determine the sequence of each of these amplimers that come out of the process. A number of years ago, uh, we demonstrated a procedure for doing next-gen-based MRD quantification using a different technology called 454 pyro sequencing. And I included this only to show just how much data is generated because uh, this is actually a patient with CLL. We amplified the entire immunoglobulin gene repertoire. Each of these panels represents every single J segment associated with every single V segment. Every blade of grass here on this map shows a VJ family of recombinants. So this patient's clone in their CLL was detectable as they went through a reduced intensity allogeneic transplant, eventually disappearing. But within the repertoire of immunoglobulin genes, we can actually see that there is um, depletion of the disease-based clone and reconstitution of the repertoire. So there's actually a tremendous amount of data that's generated with next generation sequencing that is somewhat hidden in the report that you now get clinically um, from the clinically validated assay. This has been developed now to include a uh, positive control that is spiked in at a specific quantity that allows absolute quantification of the disease-specific clones so it can rep be reported out as the number of leukemic or the number of myeloma clones per million uh, white blood cell nuclei. Uh, we demonstrated uh, also uh, that this technology is uh, not prone to a substantial amount of sequencing error, and there's a tremendous amount of repl replicability between different assays done at different times, as well as if you assay both alleles of the immunoglobulin gene within one patient. This was validated in acute lymphoblastic leukemia against uh, quantitative PCR in a number of patients here demonstrating a very high level of concordance between the consensus PCR followed by next generation sequencing along with the patient specific uh, quantitative PCR and has also been compared against flow cytometry, again showing a very high level of correlation when disease burden is above 0.01%. But again, there are patients that are not detectable by flow cytometry that are positive by next generation sequencing at these lower levels of 0.01 to 0.0001%. Uh, 
This has also been demonstrated uh, by Adaptive Biotechnologies with the assay that they first developed in both T-cell and B-cell ALL, showing a high level of concordance between next generation sequencing and flow cytometry, but when disease burden is in the 10 to the minus 4 range and lower, it is only detectable by next generation sequencing in both diseases. And so the way the assay works is you must have a high disease burden sample to sequence for determining the dominant clone or clonotype as it's called. This will identify the specific sequence to be followed for MRD assessment. In leukemia, as well as multiple myeloma, there are a number of uh, samples that can be used for this clonotype identification, including fresh or frozen peripheral blood, bone marrow, um, lymphoma tissue can be used when it's being used uh, for research purposes for lymphoma. Bone marrow aspirate slides can be scraped of material to determine the clonotype, and formalin fixed and paraffin embedded material is suitable. The only thing that cannot be used for clonotype determination is a decalcified bone marrow core biopsy. And so once you know the clone to follow, once you have a patient in treatment, you can follow at different time points. And by looking for the specific clonotype associated with their disease, you can quantify at an absolute level how much disease burden is left. This has all culminated in what's now called the ClonoSeq assay from Adaptive Biotechnologies, which is the only FDA-approved MRD assay in the United States. When you send a sample for sequencing from a disease-bearing sample, they will sequence the immunoglobulin heavy chain, both complete v VDJ and partial DJ recombinants, the immunoglobulin ca kappa light chain, as well as T cell receptors beta, delta, and gamma, and in an ALL patient, you may have rearrangements of both the immunoglobulin and T cell receptor genes, and so sometimes there may be more than one clone to follow. Once the clonotypes to follow have been identified, when you send MRD samples, they will be followed, uh, only those um, disease-related clonotypes will be followed, and you can follow the disease burden. So does this higher level of sensitivity that now gets us down to one in a million or 10 to the minus six level of sensitivity actually have meaning? This is a study in patients who uh, underwent treatment on a pediatric ALL treatment protocol using next generation sequencing to quantify MRD and shows that MRD above the level of 10 to the minus four as well as below the level of 10 to the minus four have equivalent uh, associations with impaired uh, um, event-free survival in these patients, suggesting that the higher level of sensitivity is actually important. This is another study that was done retrospectively with a much larger number of samples, again showing that MRD using uh, the next generation sequencing approach could discriminate patients who were negative by both flow and next gen um, and had a statistically significant impaired survival compared to those who were only, um, uh, who were detectable by both. Um, uh, all of the adult doctors are, of course, looking at these survival curves in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and are quite jealous, but this is a pediatric study. This has been conducted retrospectively also in an adult SWOG study showing that patients who had MRD that was not detectable by either flow cytometry or next generation sequencing had excellent outcomes. Those who were detectable by both had abysmal outcomes, but those who were not detectable by flow but still detectable by the higher sensitivity next generation sequencing approach did have a statistically significant uh, impairment in survival, suggesting that this higher level of uh, disease assessment is actually important. Although NextGen has not been systematically uh, applied to um, other situations such as pre and post transplant, it is important to recognize that these are also time points at which it's important to assay for MRD. This is a pediatric study that used quantitative PCR to uh, quantify disease, showing that patients who had greater than 10 to the minus four disease burden uh, prior to transplant had a very high level of relapse, whereas those going into transplant MRD negative had excellent outcomes. This is a similar study that was conducted in adults, uh, here using uh, quantitative PCR for T cell receptor and immunoglobulin gene rearrangements, showing again that the patients who went into the transplant MRD positive accounted for essentially all of the patients who were fated to relapse, whereas going into the transplant MRD negative was associated with an excellent outcome. This is another study that was conducted in pediatric patients uh, via the COG and is another glimpse into how important this higher level of sensitivity through next generation sequencing can be 
in the post-transplant setting, looking at days 30, 100, and uh, I think that says six or eight months after transplant, you can see that if you use flow cytometry, you can't really discriminate the fate of patients um, early on because of the lower level of sensitivity, whereas with the higher level of sensitivity using next generation sequencing, as early as day 30, you can predict the likelihood of relapse at a much higher level in patients who were, uh, had detectable disease. So in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we have the unique situation of having a drug that's actually been approved for application in patients with MRD. Uh, this is, of course, blenitumumab, the bispecific T-cell engager, and the data from the BLAST study that was conducted in patients who had greater than 0.1% disease burden after three blocks of intensive chemotherapy went on to receive blenitumumab for one or more cycles of therapy. Many of these patients did go on to receive a hematopoietic cell transplant. You can see the conversion success from MRD positive above 0.1% to MRD negative below 0.01% was 80%. Uh, and uh, this was useful across a wider range of MRD burden, as well as in first remission, as well as second and subsequent remission, and was useful across a wide range of uh, ages. It is more successful when employed in first remission with a median uh, progression-free survival of 35 months compared to about 12 months when employed in second remission. And these are the Kaplan-Meier curves that show those differences. There was also some provocative data in the BLAST study showing that patients who did or did not receive a hematopoietic cell transplant after receiving blenitumumab for MRD had similar long-term survival. There was a uh, longer time to relapse in patients who went on to receive transplants, um, but this is now uh, considered hypothesis generating that there may in fact be patients with ALL who have MRD that can be eradicated using blenitumumab without a subsequent allogeneic transplant. And so the blenitumumab approval has been now codified into the NCCN guidelines for the management of MRD positive B cell ALL. Um, and patients should receive blenitumumab en route to a hematopoietic cell transplant. And so putting that all together, this is what my algorithm would be for management of an adult patient with ALL in first complete remission. If they did not come with high-risk lesions and they achieve an MRD negative remission, meaning less than 10 to the minus four, they should continue with the chemotherapy regimen they are proceeding with. If they came with any high-risk lesions, including Philadelphia chromosome, pH-like, MLL rearrangements, um, or had greater than 10 to the minus four disease burden at the end of induction or subsequent to uh, induction if they became MRD positive uh, at a later time point, these patients are considered high risk. I put it in parentheses here that the management of pH positive patients is uh, now somewhat changing. We're trying to avoid transplant by using panatinib in many patients. So for transplant eligible patients who are MRD negative, they should go directly to transplant. MRD positive patients should receive blenitumumab as a bridge to transplant. Ineligible patients should continue with their consolidation and maintenance therapy. And those who are MRD positive should receive blenitumumab. And now we have a somewhat data-free space in terms of managing patients in this particular setting. Many of us are putting them on maintenance therapy. So I've summarized in both pH negative and pH positive ALL the methods that can be used. I didn't talk about pH positive because Prashant already introduced BCR able quantitative PCR, and I think everyone is familiar with that. You can use BCR able PCR to quantify residual disease in pH positive, as well as the next generation immunoreceptor approach or multi-parameter flow cytometry. It is absolutely essential to assess MRD at the end of induction. It is now in the NCCN guidelines as well as other uh, consensus statements that every two to three months thereafter, it is important to verify that MRD negative patients remain MRD negative and to change your therapy if they have an MRD progression. In maintenance, it can be useful every three to six months. In the pre-transplant setting, it is absolutely essential now to the, due to the approval of blenitumumab as a bridge to transplant. And in the post-transplant setting, this can be assessed every two to three months to help guide immune suppression tapers and other maneuvers to eradicate disease. So I want to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about what are some of the important remaining questions we have in ALL-MRD as well as other diseases. 
We actually don't have a tremendous amount of data to give us guidance about the uh, role of higher sensitivity uh, assessment going below 10 to the minus 4. I already introduced this one study that looked at uh, the predictive value of uh, disease burden less than 10 to the minus 4, but there are not many studies that have looked at these lower disease burdens, and I think to have more confidence in making clinical decisions at these lower disease burdens, we need to have more studies um, that assess this. I do think that one thing that higher sensitivity MRD assessment may actually be providing as a benefit is a safeguard against the role of hemodilution. So even if you dilute the sample, if you have a much higher sensitivity assay, hopefully we can still detect disease even if you have a poor quality um, uh, sample. Another thing that a lot of people are thinking about is, well, now that we have these very high sensitivity assays, could we potentially assay MRD in the peripheral blood and obviate the need for bone marrow assessment? Uh, we demonstrated in acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients that the mean disease burden in the bone marrow is about 10 to 100 times higher than in the peripheral blood. But if the disease burden is about 10 to the minus 6 in the bone marrow, uh, excuse me, 10 to the minus 4 in the bone marrow, if you have an assay that goes to 10 to the minus 6 in the peripheral blood, you should be able to detect it. And this study actually demonstrates that for um, uh, patients that have uh, low disease uh, burden in the bone marrow, it is detectable. Um, uh, it is detectable in the peripheral blood using these high sensitivity next generation assays. So we also need to have additional studies to help guide us in terms of the meaning of MRD in the context of different uh, genotypes. Uh, does MRD less than 10 to the minus 4 actually mean the same thing in normal karyotype ALL as it does in MLL rearranged or pH-like ALL? We do not have uh, robust data to help guide us. We also do not know the best time and frequency to assess MRD. The guidelines from the NCCN are simply consensus guidelines and not based on data that have optimized the use uh, and frequency of this. We also need to have additional studies to help us further refine the use of MRD as a trigger for therapy. The blenitumumab label specifies disease burden must be greater than 0.1% or 10 to the minus 3, but we should probably investigate whether blenitumumab can be equally or more efficacious if we implement it at lower disease burdens. Additionally, if a patient has low disease burdens of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 after multiple cycles of intensive chemotherapy, should we use that potentially to guide patients to transplant? We don't have robust data to guide those decisions. So the summary here is that MRD quantification is actually very essential for caring for both pediatric and adult patients with ALL. Anyone who takes care of even one ALL patient per year, please find a way to get an accurate assessment of MRD because it's going to help you provide a better outcome for your patient and actually can make clinical decisions such as the implementation of blenitumumab for MRD positive disease. Um, this is predictive of disease-free and overall survival uh, at uh, multiple time points. So this can be employed even if your patient has not had an MRD assessment and they're two or three cycles into their therapy. Go ahead and get an MRD assessment and make decisions based on it. You can currently choose between flow-based or next-generation-based MRD quantification because the high level of correlation above 10 to the minus 4. We uh, only have Clonaseq as the FDA-approved uh, test. Um, but many centers have in-house flow or use vendors that will provide MRD uh, by flow cytometry. And until we have data about the role for lower disease burdens, I think it's quite suitable to use either one of these. We do need additional studies to help guide us with these lower disease burdens in terms of making earlier clinical decisions and uh, potentially identifying patients that could be cured, for instance, with blenitumumab because they're treated at low disease burden and then not need an allogeneic transplant. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we do need to try and disambiguate what the role of MRD is, is in the context of different genotypes because there's probably an interaction between gen genotype and MRD at various time points. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll pass it back to Gail.